Welcome everybody to Radicalize Truth Survives. I'm Heidi Sigmund Kuda. This is episode 116. Today we are going to be talking to a geopolitical analyst from Finland, Yoni Oskola. He does incredible work. He does brilliant Twitter threads that explain how Trump's shadow government is working and what we need to focus on as we defeat MAGA. Have a listen. All right, Yoni Ascola, thank you so much for being with us here today. I am very, very thrilled. Um, like so many people we meet uh, who are basically frontline warriors in this moment in time on the virtual battlefield, I happened to come across one of your threads and it was very, very important. But before we get to some of the work I want to discuss um, that you've been doing, can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Uh, let them know a bit about yourself and your areas of expertise. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be uh, on this podcast. And uh, yeah, on my background, I'm Yoni. I'm from Finland. I'm 31 years old. And uh, I'm a PhD candidate in social and public policy at Charles University in Prague. And my, uh, my research is on social, public and social policy. So my research is not really related to these topics that we will discuss today. I'm uh, doing research mostly about welfare states and how to improve welfare states. Cool. And that's what I do as a for my studies and for my as my job. But then my passion is more in geopolitics and uh, anything related to that. And uh, as a Finn, I have done my military service and I studied at MGMO in Moscow, which is the School of um, International Relations and Geopolitics for Russia that produces all their diplomats and and uh, a lot of their politicians. And uh, because of that, I have this background that makes me interested in this topic even if it's not something that i work with in my research and, yeah. Uh, yeah well you're doing a great job and actually i'm really excited to hear um about the work that you're doing um because i think that understanding how we are going to survive this new feudalism that oligarchs are trying to push on us versus how we actually are able to lift people up is really going to be the the tricky bit of our future. So I am so thrilled. Now I want to jump right in to your shadow government thread. This was a thread from October 25th on the platform formerly known as Twitter, where you talk about meet Trump shadow government, a group of South African oligarchs who admire Vladimir Putin and have a deep dislike for democracy, looking to seize power behind the scenes. This thread is absolutely jaw droppingly brilliant. And can you tell us kind of why you wanted to write that and what you need Americans to know. We are, full disclosure, filming the day before the most consequential election in America since 1860. And I think this thread gets it to, you know, it gets to the heart of the threat. Thanks, yeah. Uh, the main reason why I, why I started writing on Twitter uh, about six months ago when I started doing threads was because I've been uh, raising money for Ukraine for a bit over a year and my brother has done it for a longer time and until uh, this year we were relying on my brother's clients to get money to buy trucks and then a friend of mine who uh, is also a youtuber who collects money for ukraine his name is artur Rehi. he's from estonia and he told me that maybe i should start writing some of my analysis and publishing it because i was always talking about this subject and always discussing it but i wasn't publishing anything and then i did that with the idea that I would collect uh, following online and then obviously I would fight this information and give some simple tools or simple points to people so that they can actually discuss this and if they have someone who is pro-Russian around them they can actually use those arguments but then at the same time I could use this following to actually collect, uh, fundraise money for Ukraine and bring mm -hmm. trucks and drones to, to Ukraine and uh, because of that everything I post or a big part of what I post is uh, posted with the goal of helping Ukraine and fighting Russian disinformation. And because of that, uh, obviously, I'm also fighting against Donald Trump being elected because Donald Trump, uh, to me, would be a huge risk for Ukraine, even if the American aid to Ukraine under the current administration hasn't been perfect. But sometimes if you have the choice between a little help and no help, a little help is much better. and. Uh, I see Donald Trump as a huge risk, and because of that, I write about it. And uh, now, for example, before the election, during the last few days, I'm focusing more on that. 
but uh, other than that usually i write more about ukraine and uh, how other conflicts around the world uh, might influence the war in ukraine but uh, well, thank you for your work why did you feel it was important that you alerted people to the south african oligarchs obviously you talk about uh peter thiel and his relations to jd vance you also uh talk about elon musk and his background on and on, you've got David Saxon here. Why is it important for people to know about this particular group of uh, South African and foreign born oligarchs? I think it's important because a lot of people who vote end up voting without knowing a lot of details about the candidates and their policy and their character. And they might have heard about some scandal or, or so on, but they don't necessarily know the details. And a lot of people who vote for Donald Trump are fiscally conservative American uh, normal people who think that he's a, he's the right choice and who are used to voting for a normal Republican candidate. And the reason I'm writing these threads and pointing out uh, who is behind Donald Trump is to show that he's not a normal Republican candidate. He's not a Republican in any way in the sense uh, how, how it used to be. He's not fiscally conservative and he's backed by people who have very different interests compared to what Republicans used to have. Right. So it's comparing him to McCain or Romney or all these people who are still there not so long ago, Donald Trump is very different. And um, that PayPal mafia and Elon Musk, they are people who hold very pro-Russian views, but also uh, quite pro-Chinese views and in general views that are not in the interest of the U.S. as a country. And uh, they're also isolationists, but they're not isolationists by ideology. They're isolationists because they want to make profit and have business in China and Russia and because of that being an isolationist is good for them but isolation uh, isolationism is not good for the US and it's not in the US interest so that's the reason I want to point out that it's quite dangerous uh, for Amer for the US to elect someone who is 78 and who is clearly in cognitive decline and who has a vice president who is owned by a group of foreign oligarchs who have interests that are not the ones of the US as a country. Thank you so much for that. I have a handful more questions, but I know High Fidelity probably wants to jump in. So you go, bro. So one, I mean, yes, it's it's very obvious to everyone in the world that Russia is a threat, right? Uh, right now, the kinetic part of World War III is occurring in Ukraine. Uh, we have seen the hybrid warfare that Russia is carrying out in Georgia, the country, um, Lat uh, Lithuania, Moldova, uh, the people are realizing this in the Baltic states and they're turning away from Russia and they're turning towards the EU. What would you say to Americans, French, uh, English, even Germany, right? Because Schultz is trying to peddle some bullshit about Russia. What would you say to these people as to what happens when you placate a tyrant like Putin? I actually grew up in France, so I, because of that, I have quite some knowledge on how French people view this. And uh, France is a good example, just like Germans, of a country that doesn't necessarily understand the importance of the situation. And they don't understand that Russia is actually at war with us. They think that they are at war with us. But people in France or Germany don't necessarily understand that. I think one of the main issues of France that Germany doesn't have is that France actually is a country that would like to be a big regional power and a big diplomatic player. And France, because of that, has always had this uh, feeling that they don't want to align too strongly with the U.S. They prefer to actually uh, be some sort of middle ground between, in the past it was the USSR and now it's Russia and China. And uh, that's a big disadvantage because, uh, and that's a big issue because by doing that, they are hurting Ukraine and they are hurting the security of Europe as a whole. Um, I think the only way to make these people understand over time is if they, if more of these events happen and then slowly people start understanding. France has been a bit lucky in the sense that there have been Russians operating in Africa and kicking uh, France out of some African countries. And this has woken up some of the French people about this issue. But then when we come to Germany, uh, Germany has always been under U.S. protection after uh, World War II. And because of that, they've been able to focus on their industry and not really care so much about 
having aircraft carriers or trying to do anything far away from home. So Germany has been able to kind of uh, selfishly uh, act and just act in the interest of its industries, whether it's on monetary policy or whether it's on foreign policy. And uh, Germany has then suddenly understood now that it's not possible. And uh, Scholz was one of those guys who was actually quite anti-West back in the days. But then when the war, the full-scale war started, he he understood that that was an issue. But now he's backpedaling a bit, as you said, and he's uh, he still doesn't fully grasp the the issue here, and he doesn't understand that the war is actually existential for not only for Europe but also for or not only for Ukraine but for Europe as a whole. But uh, yeah. The issue here is that if they haven't understood by now, after almost three years, I don't know if, uh, how they will understand. Uh, but at some point, I guess, if something big happens, if uh, Russia shoots a missile at a NATO base or something, I don't know, yeah. they might wake up at that moment. I just, you know, 80 years ago, uh, the German, you know, business elite that had propped up a genocidal maniac, um, many of them were executed for hanging, ultimately. Or they were bombed in their bunkers, or some of them committed suicide. Some of them ran away to Argentina. Like these stories never end well. I'm reading a book about appeasement. You don't make nice with these monsters. That's oh. not how this works. And we at RadPod have always seen, and the reason we always bring in geopolitical analysts and we always bring in war correspondents from Ukraine and filmmakers from Ukraine is we want people to never forget that what happens in Ukraine matters through Europe, through America, Canada, wherever. And we believe that Trump must be defeated and Ukraine must win. And can you tell Americans from where you are, being in Finland, having lived in France, having going to school in Prague, how important it is for Americans to get this election right? We have two very specific choices, a prosecutor, and a felon, and that felon, people forget, was he was working for Putin in his first administration. He seems to be very much aligned with a new axis of evil. So what is sort of the wake-up call for those who may not have voted yet or don't quite understand the stakes? Yeah, I think the fact that Vladimir Putin, who is someone who actually hates the U.S. and wants the U.S. not to succeed and to to fail and the fact that he's putting so much money and so much effort into getting Donald Trump uh, into the White House, that is a strong sign that maybe he's not working in the interest of the U.S. And of course, if we listen to what Donald Trump says and what the people around him say, uh, Donald Trump was already a bad man in 2016, but he's even worse now because back then he had some mainstream Republicans around him who were uh, not all isolationists and not all uh, working on behalf of Russia and China, but now he's surrounded by people who actually work for foreign interests or actually, or at least act as if they were working for them. And uh, yeah, it's for Europe, it's existential, but for, for the U.S. as well. So uh, it's a very important election. And of course, there are a million things that Trump has done wrong and he doesn't really have much going on for him. But I think American... Uh, normal middle class families and parents should think about the message they're going to send to their children if in four years or at some point Trump is the president and Trump is Trump is turning the U.S. into some sort of more authoritarian country than it is now. And when Trump has more uh, scandals and more issues, how will they explain to their children that they voted for this person who is a rapist and a convicted felon, uh, felon and who is a traitor to the U.S. works for Russia. How will they explain that and how will they feel about it? And uh, all that for just because they fail for Russian disinformation and for Republican disinformation. So it's thank crucial. you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, that's the next question I had for you. Um, hi, Fi. I'm sorry. I just want to get this one out of the way. It is complete and total madness that I go on to the platform formerly known as Twitter and I see people who are allegedly respected disinformation researchers being completely dismissive on Russia's impact on American citizens. We have given a foreign adversary direct access to our minds. We have U.S. Putinists who are doing pro-Kremlin propaganda 
all day long wrapped up as patriotism. And when you see people saying, oh, even after September, with all the bombshells that came out in September, we still are awaiting that 600 uh, name list from US based Russian propaganda, as we've not seen it yet. But when you see people allegedly uh, experts on disinformation minimizing Russia's impact on America and elsewhere, what does that tell you? These are opportunists who don't put the country before the party. Uh, there mm -hmm. are lots of uh, Republicans in the U.S. who are great people and who recognize that Trump is, uh, is an issue, but there are also people who dream of getting maybe a job in the next administration or just want to mm -hmm. not, uh, not make any enemies or, or still exist once Trump gets elected, if he does, and hopefully not, of course. But I think that explains why a lot of Republicans who understand deep inside that Trump is a massive issue try to not think about it and uh, ignore this issue. And there are lots of people on, uh, on Twitter who are claim to be Republicans and claim to be uh, pro-Ukraine, but at the same time uh, keep criticizing uh, Paris and keep and they never criticize Trump. And those people are obviously very dishonest and uh, do a lot of mental gymnastics. But I think it's because of opportunism at the end of the day. Thank you for that. My, uh, I'm so sorry, Hi-Fi. I'm just so eager to get my questions out of the way. One thing I want, how do you define useful idiot? Because I see a lot of useful idiots and I know you've done threads on useful idiots. So what is your definition? To me, a useful idiot is someone who is pushing foreign interests, but not doing it because of being paid or not knowing that they are actually pushing those foreign uh, interests. So so, for example, Tim Pool or those people, they're not useful idiots because a useful idiot is someone who is, uh, or at least they're likely not to be useful idiots, but a useful idiot is someone who falls for the propaganda and who, who doesn't do it on purpose, while a foreign agent or trader is someone who knows that they are working on behalf of a foreign interest and betraying the country. Perfect. High five. So we talk about... Uh... You know, we talk about Russia's influence on the election. And, and yes, there there is a lot of messaging that comes out of Russia. But what I've found, you know, Heidi mentioned those 600 influencers who are paid by Russia. Uh, we have found, you know, digital media marketing companies in Israel, Romania, uh, Chechia, um, you know, the Philippines, Africa, and Nigeria, we, we find these troll farms everywhere. Is it Russian influence if it's coming from these other countries and these other people? Like, how do we define that? And how do we explain to people this is a distributed global system? Yeah. How do we do that? In some cases, if it's outsourced by Russia to a foreign country and their troll farms, then it's Russian, but not all troll farms work for Russia, there are other countries that want Trump elected and uh, other leaders. So, for example, Netanyahu would really like to get uh, Trump back in the office. And it's likely due to the fact that Trump would let him do whatever he wants and doesn't want to control him in any way. So, so for example, if there would be a troll farm in Israel working on behalf of Netanyahu, that's just, a, I'm, I'm not saying that it's the case, but if that would be the case, it wouldn't be surprising that they would push Trump's uh, interests and his election because Netanyahu clearly wants Trump elected. And for example, China also likely wants Trump elected because Trump is, at the end of the day, someone who will weaken the US and that's what China wants. So there are a lot of actors, of course, Orban, for example, in Hungary is also someone who wants Trump elected. So, so there are lots of actors who want Trump elected. So it explains the fact that not everyone is Russian, but there are also, I think Russians play a huge role in this, but but there are other actors as well. It seems like all the people supporting Trump are authoritarian fascists of some varying degree. Mm -hmm. um, they're outsourcing this to people who are doing the work, and the social media platforms are allowing this to happen, right? And so here's yeah. here's my consideration. I've been thinking about this. I just like to bounce this off of you. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I think is there should be uh, absolute regulation where if a person is in any way, shape or form compensated to post anything on social media, that post must be labeled. 
Absolutely. No. Uh, and if, if you do not label it, the person who posts it is liable for a fine. The company mm -hmm. they work for is liable for a fine. And yeah. the social media platform where the misinformation, whatever the paid post was made, is also mm -hmm. liable for a fine. So that's idea one. And then the second one is simply geotagging every single location and blocking VPNs that allow escape from that. Mm. Those are my two thoughts. Yeah, I think they're good ideas. The issue I have with it is that uh, the most dangerous people to me are not the ones that are, uh, are the ones where you don't expect that they actually are disinformation right. agents. And uh, of course, you can try to block VPNs. And of course, you can, we already have some regulation on influencers in Europe, for example, who need to show that they are actually advertising for something in their video, if they're selling some product or, or if it's sponsored by someone. But the issue is that uh, countries like Russia or China, they will find some way to pay the person in yeah. a way that doesn't get uh, caught. And because of that, the person will be able to act as if they were not uh, sponsored. And the issue with that then would be that people would trust that person even more because that person wouldn't have the mark that they are being paid by Russia or so well, on. Well, one I like to look for is funded by crypto donations. <laughs> yeah, uh, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So even when you were talking about Netanyahu, I was thinking how Putin seems to me to be the head of this hydra, this head of what I call the new axis of evil, where you mm -hmm. have the various fossil fuel oligarchs, the tech oligarchs. You also have those who believe in white supremacy. You have those who are homophobic. They all seem to be united over this. And, and all of them, as High Fi and I have uh, you know, reported on uh, profusely, all of these folks know global warming is real. We think they're trying to have some sort of new feudalism where they get to write it out in their bunkers while we suffer. And so we see this election as a very important global event that could lead to one of two futures. And one of the most important tweaks that you have, have done in my mind is when you are talking about those oligarchs, those foreign born oligarchs like the Musks and the Teals, you say these individuals are essentially working to transform the United States into a failed and corrupt developing nation similar to 1990s Russia, where oligarchs hold the power to make decisions. That in just one tweet is why we started this show, because we saw that how many years ago and this is the warning. And can you and your in, in just kind of like, you know, uh, just basically speak on that for us? Because, again, I, I want I, I we have a friend, Jackie Singh, and she says that our, our brains, our 10,000 year old uh, wetware is not really able to deal with the onslaught of information and social media. So I like to write and run our podcast like it's the Teletubbies, like you're going to see the same thing over and same thing over and same thing over till you finally figure it out. So how do we explain to people, we don't want to be like 1990s Russia. That's not what our objective is here. How do we just tear that out by the roots, you know? Yeah, the 1990s Russia was a very uh, violent society with huge inequalities and, uh, and uh, people lost hope and uh, didn't think that they actually can influence um, the country. And that's why we, Russia ended up with Putin as the leader, because what Putin did is he managed to actually centralize power again and get that violence off the streets. And uh, of course, it's just a comparison. The U.S. is much more developed and won't become exactly like 1990s Russia. But, but uh, oligarchs who have a lot of money and want to buy influence and who want to be extremely involved in politics, especially on the, on the far right, they're not the nice people who just want to make money. They also have an ideology. And that ideology usually tends to serve them on a personal level because of their business interests. So they don't care about how the country is doing. They don't care about how the people in the country are doing. They want to maximize their interests. And even if looking at it from a quite rational and uh, maybe naive point of view, I think people like Peter Thiel or Elon Musk have also darker sides to them, but just their business interest alone is not the same interest as the interest of the country and of the people in the US. Because these people, they want to 
for example, Elon Musk, he wants to sell cars in China. He wants to sell cars in Russia. He wants to get rare earths from China and Russia. And because of that, uh, he would always oppose any confrontation with China or Russia because he wants to do business and he wants to grow and he wants to have influence. And uh, the U.S. might be in a situation at some point, it's already the case, where those countries are adversaries and it's not possible to go with that in mind or selling cars in mind. That cannot be the main thing because otherwise we have to just uh, end up in a situation where Ukraine is less important and a genocide in Ukraine is less important than Elon Musk selling cars to Chinese people. So so the interest of these oligarchs, their interests don't align with the, the interests of Americans and of the U.S. as a country. And because of that, it's really important that these people don't get the power that they want to have. And uh, in the case of these guys, they are not Americans originally. They are people who have become Americans. They're from South Africa, even if Peter Thiel is actually from Germany, but grew up partially in South Africa yes, and in India. Yeah. And those people, they, they come from countries that don't necessarily have the same interests as the U.S. And then on top of that, they are rich oligarchs who want to prioritize their business so they are not working on behalf of Americans or of the U.S. They are working on behalf of themselves. And if working in the interest of uh, Russia or China is in their interest, they will do it. And because of that, it, it, it's just extremely important that it's not possible to buy, for them to buy themselves into power and to, to decide the fate, of, the fate of the U.S. Thank you. That was a mic drop. My last question for you. How does the world reset with the MAGA's defeat. If we can defeat MAGA, how does the world reset? What's the first steps? And then what do we need to be prepared for? So the first part is when when it's defeated, what's the first thing you want to see? Yeah, I don't want to jinx it, but I, I have a feeling that Kamala is going to win, but I, I don't want to jinx it because the election hasn't <laughs> happened yet. We don't either. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think that first of all, we have to be ready for Trump not... Uh, accepting the defeat. And I believe that Trump is going to likely declare victory before the results are out tomorrow. Sure. Unless it's like a blowout. But if it's even a bit tight, he will probably declare victory. And I think the focus for the next two months will be on making sure that he doesn't get to the White House unless he actually wins officially, of course. But if he's trying to make some moves like in 2020, that will be the main focus. But then after that, if Harris wins and if Harris ends up in the White House in January, uh, I think some of it will happen naturally. I think uh, people like uh, Elon Musk, for example, he will understand probably because he's an individualist who cares about himself. He'll probably understand that he has to go a bit low key and not continue uh, what he's doing right now because it's going to end bad for him. But uh, I think Trump, he has so many uh, cases against him right now that if he doesn't get elected, uh, naturally he will have the, the key dates that will come at some point and uh, he will end up uh, condemned and maybe in prison. And uh, I think that will help overall slowly to get rid of him and to also get rid of this movement and of these people. But of course, that doesn't take away the root cause of this movements and uh, and there's a lot of work in terms of uh, as we discussed earlier with uh, fighting these hybrid operations and disinformation and uh, trying to get people to understand i think it will be important for journalists and for researchers to really tell people and make themselves heard about how russia managed to hijack the us in a way in 2016 and maybe at least almost now in 2024 and that's something people need to understand of course, we can't uh, blame people forever. We also have to be able to forgive people for what they've done. I'm not talking about Trump or Elon Musk, but I'm talking about the normal voters mm -hmm. who fell for it. But we have to, on a smaller scale, do a bit what Germany did after World War II to its population by telling them that this is not okay, uh, you went too far, and uh, we need to make people understand that it's been a slippery slope it started already with the Tea Party and with with uh, uh, how it went 15 years ago, and it's been a slippery slope, and it's gotten worse and worse. And uh, people need to understand what happened, and it's not going to be an easy process, but uh, a lot of work will be ahead. But I think first we need to make sure that Trump doesn't 
make some move with Mike Johnson to, to try to steal the election. Another mic drop. I mean, I could talk to you all day, but Hi-Fi, any final thoughts, final words? My, my final question for you is, you may know something about this uh, from what you actually study, and it's, a, it's about data science, right? And data science, in the terms of a welfare state, can be used to identify people, apportion benefits, uh, you know, do we need to increase or lower taxes to pay for these programs, et cetera? One of the things we talk about on this program is the use of data science to target people for manipulation online. Yeah. And one of the things I think we need is some sort of treaty. Uh, to, to me, data science is a weapon. It can be a weapon. Mm. And we need some sort of international treaties on the use of data science uh, yep. when it comes to swaying public opinion. Thoughts? In Europe, we already have some EU regulations on uh, yeah. on data and on privacy. And uh, obviously, it would be nice if we could get something that is not only in the EU and that would also include the US and maybe the whole world. It's, uh, it's something that would be really important to do. But once again, it's like with the environment and with many other issues, getting many countries to agree together is very difficult. But um, yeah, in 2016, uh, with Trump being elected with the help of data in a way that had not been done before, uh, that was the maybe the first big step of that. And it's getting worse and worse over time. And uh, if looking at the, at the ad targeted advertising that America, the fact from uh, Elon Musk is doing where in one video they're talking to Arab Americans and they're telling them that uh, Harris is sponsoring the genocide yeah. in, of Gaza. And then in the next video, they're talking to Jewish Americans and telling them that uh, Harris is actually pro-Palestine. Mm -hmm. And uh, those type of things, obviously, ideally, it would be nice to regulate them and to make it impossible. And this information should not be allowed to just spread. Uh, but the, the difficult part here is that if you ban it, of course, then free speech is, a, is an issue. But if you let it roll, it's also an issue because if you regulate and then two weeks later you say that this was actually disinformation, then it's too late. And that's why I right. want to thank also NAFO uh, online for what they're doing as work for uh, Ukraine and against disinformation as a whole. Because as Pekka Kalyaniemi, the Finnish uh, researcher on this subject, yeah. has said, is that obviously there are journalists and there are researchers who fight disinformation, but when disinformation happens, they take some time before they actually come up with an article or something to right. this. And before that, we need people online who are acting a bit like trolls in some way, but to counter this disinformation, to mock it, to kind of cut the uh, grass under its feet. That's and why that, Hi-Fi has been banned off of Twitter 100 times because yeah, <laughs> of exactly. his fabulous wartime trolling prowess. Exactly. Um, and that's, and that's, uh, that's really important. So what you just said was really incredibly important. What we just learned in America is that covert influence activities are not journalism. That is from the U.S. State Department when the flurry of Russia indictments and sanctions were coming out in September. So we now finally have something to work with. Covert influence activities are not journalism, which is why you have Peter Thiel and J.D. Vance screaming censorship. I think the shot heard around the world was the arrest of Pavel Durov, and I hope I'm right, the uh, the head of Telegram. I hope that that is why these guys are now trying to tighten their game a bit because they see that there may actually be uh, repercussions for the criminal activity that has been occurring on these platforms. Maybe because I just saw Godzilla minus one last night. Yesterday was Godzilla Day, and I went to see this epic film. But the very last scene after this monster is defeated is the beginning of the monster regenerating. So yeah. my feeling is no matter what happens tomorrow, this week with this election, we have to completely neutralize and defeat Putin, the Kremlin, the head of the Hydra for the world to be able to reset from this new, uh, this new fascist creep, this authoritarianism. I think we have to start at the top and I think the police going by are agreeing with me right now. But but uh, I, I just, you know, just final thoughts on how no matter what happens, 
this does not go away unless it's thoroughly defeated, as you mentioned about, you know, how people were treated in Germany post World War II. Exactly. And I think uh, one last thing I'd like to say that is somewhat related to this, but that is something that people forget a lot is we often talk about Russia, we talk about other countries and maybe Orban in Hungary and so on. But all these people, the final boss, the, the highest level behind them is still China. And China is something that is not discussed enough. China is the biggest enabler of Russia. Russia would not exist at this point. Russia wow. would not be able to fight its war against Ukraine. And Russia would not be able to have these operations if China would not allow it. 75% uh, of Russian exports used to go to Europe before the full-scale war. And China has replaced them. And China didn't need those imports, but they did it just to help Russia. So, so when we blame Russia, and we should blame Russia, for operations and for their war and so on. But at the end of the day, behind Vladimir Putin, there's Xi Jinping. And uh, that's something really important that people should not forget. Uh, everything that happens and everything that Russia does is uh, enabled by China. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That is really incredibly important. My last thing I'd love for you is one zinger line on how people need to pay attention to the shadow government because i would actually say that the shadow government includes the heads of the countries that you're just mentioning mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I think people should look at the people at who is financing who uh, they should look in the case of donald trump they should look at the paypal mafia elon musk but they should look at what these people have been saying about china russia and so on, and, and then ask themselves why uh, these people who are uh, owning J.D. Vance and who are backing Donald Trump, why is it so important for them to get Donald Trump elected now? And uh, why do they push this pro-Russian agenda, which is actually an agenda that is not good for their chances of being elected? And uh, when thinking about Donald Trump, Donald Trump is a populist, and a populist should actually say what people want to hear to get elected. But on the questions of Ukraine, and uh, nowadays China and Russia, Donald Trump goes against the uh, mainstream view because most Democrats support Ukraine, but more than half of Republicans actually also support Ukraine. And Donald Trump still goes against this. And uh, these oligarchs, they have put J.D. Vance, who is one of those isolationists, who is not a mainstream Republican and who is not going in the direction of most Republicans. So why is it so important for them to actually go against the flow and against the electors and uh, go against Ukraine. I think it's because Russia is behind them, but people should ask themselves those questions when, when they're voting. Mic drop. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. I've just learned so much. High fidelity. Any final thoughts or should we just uh, thank this man for his time? Uh, one final thought is, if you have any question about who owns J.D. Vance, just look at how <laughs> Peter Thiel helped him get elected in Ohio using yeah. data and money. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. those are my final thoughts. Thank you, sir. Thank you Good. so much. We're so thrilled that you were with us today, Joni. Uh, we're very, very hopeful that you will come back uh, yeah. post MAGA defeat and talk about what we need to be focusing on next. Thank you so That'd much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me.